My name is Dawn Wright. I am Chief Scientist at ESRI, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to one of our SIGs, a special interest group. This is a climate special interest group entitled A New Era of Climate Understanding. And we have a new administration, as we all know, uh, and that brings with it many opportunities to better understand the impacts of climate change on many areas of national interest. And hence, this special interest group meeting will be a panel discussion with leading representatives uh, of several federal agencies offering their perspectives from their agency's work to measure, analyze, and promote the understanding of the impacts of climate change. So we are extremely pleased to welcome a distinguished slate of panelists this morning. So I'm gonna put that up on the screen for you. And uh, we are uh, anticipating a fantastic uh, discussion uh, among them. Uh, and as you can see, we have uh, NASA uh, with congratulations uh, continuing for the Perseverance Rover, uh, Argonne National Laboratory of the US Department of Energy, uh, NOAA and the US Forest Service. I am going to introduce our panelists each in turn, but we are extremely excited uh, especially about these agencies because they are in fact spatial data agencies in our view at ESRI. Spatial is a very huge percentage of the data that these agencies have invested literally billions of dollars in. Spatial is special. It lies at the heart of just about everything that matters to these agencies and to us, such as where to, for instance, best sustainably feed a rapidly growing population, where to ensure resilient water supplies, where to mitigate and adapt to a changing climate. All of these are inherently uh, spatial issues. So we are going to uh, launch in now to uh, statements, short statements by uh, each of our panelists representing these organizations, these agencies, and so I'm very pleased to start first with uh, Lawrence Friedel of, of NASA. Lawrence is the director of the Applied Sciences Program in the Earth Science Division at NASA headquarters. And that program, as we know, works with partners worldwide to inform decision-making, enhance quality of life, and strengthen the economy using Earth observations. Lawrence has been with NASA since 2002 and he has served as the program manager for health and air quality and several other program areas. And as director, Lawrence is a vice chair of the interagency US group on earth observations, uh, often also known as GEO, uh, and represents the United States in the international group on earth observations or GEO. He serves as the NASA principal for the interagency civil applications committee and is on the International Committee for Remote Sensing uh, of Environment. And before joining NASA, Lawrence worked at the US Environmental Protection Agency, where he focused on applications of geospatial data and technology. And he also served as a space shuttle flight controller in NASA's mission control. Lawrence received a master's degree in public policy from Harvard uh, Harvard's uh, Kennedy School of Government, where he specialized in science and technology policy. And before that, he received a bachelor degree in mechanical and aerospace engineering from Princeton University. He also received a certificate in space policy and law from the International Space University. So we are extremely pleased and honored to welcome Lawrence as the first of our panelists. And so Lawrence, I give over to you now and uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you so much to, to Esri for the Federal GIS Conference um, and thanks to all of the organizers for this event. Uh, and I have to say the preparation to, to us as speakers was, was fantastic. And thank you, Dawn, for, for both for moderating and for that very, very generous uh, introduction. So when, when we first, when we first, Esri first talked to us about it, you know, I think we were thinking like, wow, climate, but that is a really, really broad, broad topic, and there's, it's really rich. Uh, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, the administration um, recently, I mean, they, they asked us to, to let them know what parts of NASA Earth Science dealt with climate. 
And our first initial reaction internally was sort of like, yes, all of it. Um, we obviously then followed up with specific information, like every satellite mission, um, all of our research areas, all of our application areas and all. Um, and why is this? It's, it's because climate is part of the overall Earth system. And really what NASA does, like other agencies on the panel, looks at the Earth from this complete Earth system science standpoint, uh, where everything is interacting with one another. And so to look at climate is essentially just looking at many of the different aspects. Uh, we certainly recognize the fact that, you know, when you have uh, emissions, that that is a driver and a forcer to create you know, the, the climate change and then that climate change um, and the increased CO2 and, and other, you know, other levels, um, that essentially creates drivers and forcings for these other elements like sea level rise um, and, you know, the melting ice caps and all that. Uh, and so to look at it, you know, you sort of have to look at the whole thing. And so I wanted to quickly talk about sort of three topics today. Um, one is quickly about the climate observations a little bit about what we're doing on climate modeling, uh, and then getting a little bit in terms of how we're seeing it from the standpoint of the application of climate data. Uh, and so together with the airborne campaigns and the ground sensors that we have, NASA's really sort of known for the satellite piece. And so the space-based observations, we've got 20 satellites. And so we're looking at many things that are related to the, the climate um, and to the Earth system that connects up with climate, from ice sheets to sea ice extent, I'm looking at CO2 levels, sea surface temperature, sea surface height, uh, and many different aspects. And the nice thing about the satellites, they provide this global observation so we get consistency uh, around the planet. Um, we're not really going very high resolution. Actually, everything we have is sort of 15 meters or coarser. Um, you know, it, but what we really do is exploit the electromagnetic spectrum. So we're really focused on exploiting things in the sort of the spectral range. Um, and we need to have all these satellites because there's many parts of the Earth system and there's no one sensor that really can capture it all. Uh, and we also recognize that climate change is affecting different parts of the system differently. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, and the system is responding. Um, and so the, for, the, for these observations, we sort of think about them in these two categories. One is the sustained observations that we need to do the research, tease out the signal. These these are things like satellite altimetry for sea surface height um, that you know connects up with sea level rise, um, solar radiance, and the Earth radiation budget, and all. And then we have other ones that are more of an experimental standpoint, sort of a proof of concept measurements, like we did years ago with with um, sea surface salinity in terms of identifying you know how salty some of the oceans are and how that varies, uh, and that really helps us to do some targeted process studies. <laughs> Excuse me, all of our data, we, we really pride ourselves in making sure it's highly calibrated <clears throat> and all of it is freely, openly available. Uh, and we also want to point out that it's policy neutral. And so we recognize that, you know, that the data itself does not take a stand on policy. Um, and so we really need to make sure that these that the data sets are really well calibrated for whatever policy analysis may occur using them. I will say that for GIS, that not all of our products are in GIS ready formats and not all of them necessarily need to be. Like some of the lower level ones, like the level one products, not all of those necessarily need to be in a GIS ready format, but we are continuously, continuously examining which, project, which products should be. Um, and frankly, if you all have some ideas um, or some products that you're interested in that aren't in GIS ready formats, then please let us know and we can consider that. I want to quickly turn to, to modeling. Um, wow, five minutes goes quick. Um, we talk about climate modeling, but really we need to think about it in terms of Earth system modeling. And so for the modeling that NASA is doing, um, we really span spatial scales from sub-kilometer to global, uh, and we're looking at time scales of from weeks to millennia. Um, we've got two key modeling efforts. One is the Global Modeling and Assimilation Office, or GMAO, um, and that's really looking at um, looking at doing simulations and predictions at weather and climate time scales, as well as the GIS, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, the Model E that they have. Uh, that's looking at some of the causes of climate change in the 20th and 21st centuries, uh, and really looking at sort of these multi-decadal projections. And so these has been some of the major contributions to the IPCC uh, and their assessments. Um, 
for our modeling efforts, we really focus on observation-driven modeling. And so, so what does this mean? It means that given all the observations that NASA and others are taking, we try to squeeze as much juice out of our observations as we can. And so we really try to maximize the value from that. We're also trying to use these models to as sort of as a complete, looking at the Earth as a complete dynamic system. And so we're emphasizing the comprehensiveness in terms of as many processes as possible as well as making sure it's sort of representative of the interactive sort of Earth system. Some of the challenges that we're facing is even just computing capabilities. So, you know, it's not quite as growing as rapidly. And so our interest is we're trying to increase resolution and increase processes to get more realistic and to get more comprehensive. Um, but that's really going to take some computing capabilities. Um, we're looking to try Try and see how do we add the human systems? How do we add skillful representation? Uh, that's certainly a challenge. Uh, and then for the time scales, um, I would say that we've been really good at looking at the global decade, multi decadal scale. Uh, and I would say moving to a range at the regional or short term scale, I think those are going to be some basic challenges. Um, and in the next five years, I would say a really goal that we have is trying to get to sort of the next generation sub seasonal, the seasonal predictions. So I would say that. Um, I know I'm at time, so maybe I can pick up some of the applications um, during the during you know during the discussion period. So back Great. to you, Don. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. That would be uh, wonderful and very very good fodder for for discussion. So to move quickly to our our next panelist, I'm very pleased to welcome now uh, Dr. Tom Wall of the Argonne National Laboratory, which is within the Department of Energy. Uh, Tom is the program lead for engineering and applied resilience in the decision and infrastructure sciences division at Argonne. And many of us are familiar with and uh, very much admire Argonne because it is a multidisciplinary science and engineering research center uh, within the US Department of Energy. And Tom co-leads Argonne's climate risk and resilience studies effort, uh, sometimes known as ACR2S. And this is a collaboration among Argonne scientists, engineers, and external partners, providing expertise in climate science and modeling, advanced computing, infrastructure risk and resilience uh, analysis, and decision science to solve national climate resilience problems. Tom also has extensive experience in critical infrastructure analysis and protection, having led large scale infrastructure resilience analysis projects for the US Department of Homeland Security, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and state and local governments. Tom earned an honors BS in civil engineering from Oregon State University, which makes me smile as I'm still on that faculty, and an MS and PhD in civil engineering from Georgia Tech. So Tom, we are extremely pleased and honored uh, to welcome you. And so I will give the stage to you now, thank you. Great, thanks, Don. I'm gonna share some slides here. Uh, so we've got a visual and uh, let me know if you're not seeing that. Otherwise, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. You're good, Tom, thanks. Great, so uh, I'll get right into it. I'm uh, with Argonne National Laboratory. We're one of about a dozen national labs uh, owned, uh, owned by the US Department of Energy. What I'll talk about today is really uh, what we're focusing on at Argonne for, for climate risk and resilience and, and applying the data that we generate to inform decision making. Um, and there's lots of other activities within the National Laboratory Complex. I mean, some of the, the, the more comprehensive Earth systems modeling that Lawrence mentioned, uh, you know, we're, we're, we are a part of a large, lot of those efforts. Um, but that's a, a partnership with, with other national labs as well. So again, I'll focus primarily on what we're doing at Argonne. Um, and really there's, there's two pillars to our work uh, on, on climate resilience and climate planning. The first is creating better data, uh, better data sets that are higher resolution, more locally relevant and more locally actionable so that uh, we, can, we can inform decision-making um, here in the United States and North America. And that's what you see in the figure on the left. So instead of modeling the entire globe, uh, there are other partner organizations like, like NASA and, and others that, uh, that that extensively model global climate, we focus on regional climate. So applying the, the massive computing power that we have with our supercomputers to a smaller spatial area, in this case, North America. And what we can effectively do is 
is model a, a greater number of smaller grid cells within this more limited spatial do domain um, in, in, in North America. Um, uh, Tom, sorry to interrupt, but I think your slides are not advancing. So maybe give that uh, another try. Let's try that. It, yeah, it just told me that they paused the sharing. So hopefully they're there back up. Okay. All right. I uh, appreciate the heads up. Let me know if that happens again. Um, so with this, with by focusing on a, on a smaller spatial domain, in this case, just North America and, and having a greater number of smaller grid cells, it's just like on your cell phone or a digital camera. If you have a a greater number of smaller pixels in, in the same space, you get a clearer picture. And so in doing this for North America, we can project it at more local scales, how climate will occur and evolve in the future. And, and then the second piece of this is then applying that, that information, that knowledge, that data to inform decision-making, to make communities more resilient, to reduce the risk to infrastructure in the future and to begin working with engineers and planners to apply that data to inform this proactive decision making to, to, to en enhance our resilience. And so I want to just take a quick quick detour to, to unpack this term risk, uh, because I think this, is, this underscores the importance of geospatial analysis and geospatial data uh, as, as a foundational component to this work. There's lots of different definitions of risk. Um, you know, most modern definitions have some component of vulnerability. And so if we then further unpack this idea of vulnerability, this, this sort of three pillar idea here is, is a concept advanced by the Inter, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, that your vulnerability to a bad thing is a function of your exposure to that, that bad thing, your sensitivity to that bad thing, and then your ability to adapt to that. But it's this exposure piece that is, you know, certainly the first step in, in a vulnerability analysis or a climate vulnerability analysis to, to feed this larger resilience analysis um, that is, you know, particularly draws upon geospatial data and geospatial information to conduct. And so I want to just walk through a sort of an example that, that we did very recently that I think illustrates the, the type of data and the use of our data, but also the importance of, of GIS tool sets in uh, as, as a foundation really for our ability to do this type of work. So uh, this is a, a model that we ran. Uh, you'll see the clip on the left is showing a, a projected future uh, rainfall event uh, in mid-century in the upper Mississippi River Basin. And we're able to combine this data from our climate model, which is currently for all of North America, we have 12 kilometer resolution. So 12 kilometer by 12 kilometer grid cells. Uh, I will, as a side note, mention that we're currently running this model again at four kilometer resolution for all of North America. So as, as Lawrence mentioned, it, it, it requires a lot of computing power to, to run these higher resolution models. And, and we're fortunate to have some, some pretty substantial machines here at Argonne. But we can combine this climate data with just really good, high quality geospatial information about topography, uh, water surface features, ground cover, land cover, those types of information to then take that rainfall data from the climate model and project how that will turn into stormwater runoff, stream flow information, and ultimately driving towards projections of future flooding. And combining this higher resolution data from uh, from these additional data sets allows us to project, in this case, for this project, pr future flooding at 200 meter resolution. And that's what the figure in the, in the center is showing. I mean, as the title alludes to, this is really what we call neighborhood scale projections. 200 meters is how will flooding in the future be different at, at my house versus a couple blocks over. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, because we have massive computing power, we're able to then scale this very local location specific type of modeling up to large regions. And that's what the figure on the right shows, this 200 meter resolution flood projections for the entire, entire Southeastern United States. And for, so for this four state region, that's over 36 million projections of, of future flooding. So we did this project, this specific project in partnership with, with AT&T. And in addition to modeling inland flooding from rainfall events, we modeled some coastal flooding from, from future storm surge events. Uh, and combine those in, in a geospatial format. And that's what the figure shows here. AT&T was familiar with FEMA floodplain maps. And so he said, sure, we can make it look like a FEMA floodplain map. And, and that's this is just one example in Charleston, South Carolina of what that combined coastal and inland flooding looked like uh, for, uh, for, for a mid-century 100 year rainfall event. 
So AT&T took that and said, great, well, here's how we're using that and applying that to our, our climate resilient, risk and resilience planning efforts. And this is, as I spoke about earlier with the vulnerability analysis, this is the, the foundation and exposure analysis of is your infrastructure exposed to these future climate threats? And if so, that allows them to focus their efforts. So with this figure, it's, it's quickly and easy for your eye to be drawn to the red areas on the map, right? These are the high risk areas where, where coastal flooding will be projected to be, to be greater in the future. But importantly, there's a lot of infrastructure that's not within these, the red areas or even the yellow or, or orange areas. And so there's a lot of infrastructure for at and system. And in this case, this is a little further down the coast. This is Savannah, Georgia. Uh, but there's a lot that's not exposed to climate impacts. And what that allows their engineers and their planners to do is then focus their efforts on the deeper dive of sensitivity analyses and adaptive capacity analyses on a subset of their infrastructure. Uh, so they can focus their finite resources to, to advance their resilience planning efforts. And I, I guess sort of the, 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 the parting note here is the foundation of all of this is an exposure analysis. And uh, you know, we have large data sets that we can tailor to these types of applications, but it all comes back to some sort of a geospatial data set uh, and analyzing that in a, ge in a geospatial system to, to look at the, the overlaps between high risk areas or high hazard areas uh, and the exposure of infrastructure within, within those regions. So that's, those are my slides. I look forward to, um, to answering questions or responding. If you have anything that we can't get to today, I invite you to send me an email. Uh, but other than that, uh, Don, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Thank you so much, Tom. That was great. Thank you. So now we'd like to uh, turn our attention to, to Noah. And so I'm very, very pleased to, to welcome Julie uh, Tertan of, of NOAA. And I hope I've pronounced your last name properly, Julie. <laughs> She uh, is the One Health and Integrated Climate and Weather Extremes Research Lead for NOAA. Julie is responsible for developing and implementing the health strategy across NOAA and with other federal, state, local, and international agencies, academic, and private sector partners. She also coordinates the NOAA One Health Working Group, which brings together NOAA data, research, information, and actions to inform health decision-making. Julie has a remarkable record of service because in addition to all of that, uh, she leads the National Integrated Health Heat Health Information System, which is an interagency and multi-sector network to reduce the health risk from heat on multiple time scales. She also co-leads the recently established joint WMOWHO study group on integrated health services. And Julie co-chairs the US Global Change Research Program, Climate Change and Human Health Group, and represents NOAA on the Pandemic Prediction and Forecasting Science and Technology Working Group. She co-chairs the, uh, the GEO EO4 Health Initiative, Community of Practice, which focuses on the development of integrated information systems for heat, cholera and other water related illnesses. And Julie was an author on the fourth national climate assessment, served on the steering committee of the US Global Change Research Program's climate and health assessment and was a convening lead author for the water related illness chapter. So Julie, a remarkable record here and we are very excited to, to hear from you. So I see that you have your slide, you, your slides are going, so take it away. Oh, excellent. Uh, Don, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you and we can see your slides. Excellent. So far, so good. So um, thank you for a very kind introduction. And I also want to echo Lawrence's thanks to Esri for putting this panel together and for the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, I'm going to take a, a slightly different tack and a combination of what we're doing at NOAA and then a few examples of prior relationships and partnerships we've had with Esri and um, hopefully seed some conversation about things for the future. So I am, as Dawn said, uh, NOAA's One Health and Integrated Climate Lead. That means uh, basically my job is at NOAA to coordinate uh, to a certain extent the health activities of our agency and to try to integrate what we do across NOAA with the health community. Um, our mission, so you know, what are we doing in this space? 
we have the weather service, we have the ocean service, we have satellite and data information service, we have the fishery service, and then I sit in the oceanic and atmospheric research part of NOAA. The climate program is within that. Um, but we also, um, our job really is about prediction, understanding and predicting changes in the climate weather, oceans and coasts, sharing that knowledge with others, and also we have a stewardship responsibility to conserve those resources. So we come at it from a slightly um, different lens in terms of understanding what's necessary, what's needed, what we should be predicting, what we should be observing to be able to make those predictions, what is just the base data that's needed. Not everything doesn't need a prediction or a forecast, but we do work pretty hard to make sure that the predictions and forecasts we make at multiple timescales are useful. And so my interface is with the health community and to make sure that those interactions are as useful as they can be. So one of the ways we approach this at NOAA is to take a real One Health approach. So looking at the intersection of animal health, human health, and ecosystem health. And a lot of what we have, what we bring to the table is environmental health and ecosystem health, you know, the climate data, the weather data, the ocean data. Um, but we do have a marine animal, strong marine animal and fisheries component. And there's a marine animal health piece to all of this too. So we've organized with the NOAA, as you see here, along these basic lines of vector-borne, water-borne, um, air quality, heat and extremes, benefits from the sea, including you know, healthy fish and natural products from the sea, which we won't get into here, um, and a few other things. So that's how we're approaching it at NOAA and have for quite a while. So this pulls together different parts of our agency working on health and allows us an opportunity to talk and plan and scheme together, basically. Um, so the piece of this I mentioned here, where is the extreme conditions? I wanted to focus a little bit on the heat component of this because this is just illustrative of one of the partnerships that, um, that we have with Esri. But before going any further, I wanted to reinforce the point that the prior two speakers have made, and that is the issue of scale. Um, you know, we have satellites, NOAA does fly some satellites, but we also do a lot of the in situ observations. The scale issue, especially when it comes to health, is a real challenge. I mean, we have global partnerships and we have global systems, global atmospheric and oceanic systems that affect, you know, very regional, sub-regional and local scales. And heat is a really good example of that. Heat is a very local thing, but it takes a ship out in the middle of the sea doing observations on a sustained basis to make a heat forecast at all. So there's a really good example of how it all needs to come together. And knowing that we're gonna have increased heat in the future, increased ambient heat, more heat waves, more extreme heat event, NOAA and CDC several years ago decided that we would try to pull together and coordinate across the federal government to start what we're doing on heat so we can do a better job of not just improving the heat wave and heat risk management during a heat wave or right before like we've been doing, but also managing heat on multiple time scales. And so you can see the agencies here where the eight or nine agencies have been in an interagency partnership um, on National Integrated Heat Health Information System, NIHIS. And I've got a link at the end if you want, but also if you just Google NIHIS, you'll find it. But the point I wanted to touch on here is to, um, there are a couple components to it. It's not just an interagency group. We really work to get down to the local level and understand user needs so we can begin to bridge this gap between, you know, what kind of information do we have at a national or subnational or regional level and what do decision makers need and at what scale do they need it? And um, we did a, a couple of pilots and in, to start, we were trying to figure out how to get this global information together and what kind of additional resources we could pull together. And this map is one of our early products of NIHIS, and it was based on the partnership with Esri, taking CDC's Social Vulnerability Index, some data from NOAA, some data from NASA, um, other agencies as well, and trying to put it together in a more comprehensive way that was searchable than actionable for folks. We're in the process of giving this a, a new lease on life and giving it a little bit more of an update. But this is a pretty big exercise and pretty novel at the time. It even included the ability to predict and look at trends in um, predictions of heat. And I will embarrass, hopefully, Jeff Donzi, who might be on the phone here. But um, in order to do this, I wanted to highlight the nature of the partnership. We don't mean to just, you know, like 
shove things off to anybody. This is a partnership. And this bottom corner here is one of your Esri colleagues actually participating in one of our workshops with decision makers to try and help figure out what this map should do. It was doing other things than just this map, but really trying to figure from the user orientation how this how this should work. So I wanted to just uh, highlight that one piece. And this is one example of, of a workshop for one of our pilots. We only did a handful of pilots, um, but we're hoping we can start to do more and really engage with the users um, in a more substantial way. The one thing we are doing, though, is a series of urban heat island mappings with other partners. And we've got, I think, almost 33 cities. And by the end of the summer, we'll have 33 cities running. And so working with you guys to, um, as a community, not just ESRI, to figure out how to make sure that information is well utilized is one of the opportunities for future collaboration, I think. And then I just wanted to put a couple of other examples. Using environmental information, climate information to predict suitability of a disease outbreak, uh, mosquito habitats, things like that. It doesn't mean that you're predicting dengue on, you know, February 23rd. It means that you might have an environment that is more suitable to either the habitat or, or environmental factors that are conducive to disease transmission. So there are many layers of doing climate sensitive to disease prediction that can be useful without having to have a model that goes all the way to predicting dengue on day X for this population, which would be a great goal, but you have steps along the way that are still quite doable and will help us manage the scale issue as well. And I'd say the same for on the water side. I was I, I want the flood model that, <laughs> that, uh, that my colleague from Argonne just mentioned, because if we can begin to couple these things together, we can do a much better job of actually tracking and mapping and maybe predicting or at least projecting future risks for harmful algal blooms and vibrios and other coastal health threats. So um, I wanted to just wrap up here and say, I think there are a few opportunities, not the least of which is actually codifying and, and um, making more aware of the, the importance of health to the environmental and our science community. I mean, I think, you know, people generally understand it, but still it is one of those issues that falls between the cracks of agencies. And I want to give kudos to NASA. I think your air quality and applications program is probably the longest standing sustained funding program that, that has been providing resources to understand this intersection of how to use at least satellite data for managing health risks. So we need more of those sustained kind of programs and dialogues. NOAA's had several that have worked on the infectious disease. The, the one that I showed you, our international research program is working on several aspects of managing and understanding infectious disease and heat and waterborne disease risks. So we are working on this issue, but I think that the opportunities come from really taking it to that next level, increasing the awareness of the connections, engaging the decision makers wholeheartedly on a sustained basis, um, talking more about the co-benefits of action and the costs of inaction, and then looking at things like, you know, coastal infrastructure, what, you know, with the coastal zone issues, what are the healthcare and healthcare facility infrastructure issues? We can take it up to a higher level than just um, individuals. We can be looking at both population level, public health, as well as a little bit more smaller scale. So I think with that, I will, I see Dawn's coming back on. I will stop sharing and thank you for the time. That was most excellent, Julie. Thank you so much. So we are moving uh, along really well here in our agenda. We have one more fantastic uh, speaker to introduce before we can open this up to more discussion and question and answer and get to the, to the meat of our, our gathering. And so with that, I am very pleased to introduce uh, Jim Ellenwood of the USDA Forest Service. Jim is involved with the national program. He is, I'm sorry, he is the national program lead for monitoring remote sensing, and geospatial analysis research. Jim has a, a distinguished 22-year career uh, at the national level for research and development and state and private forestry as the national program lead and program manager for remote sensing. And before that, he served 12 years in three regional offices, one supervisor's office, and five ranger districts for the National Forest Systems Deputy Area in various positions as timber and forest land management planner, forest and district silviculturist, uh, and inventory specialist, all for the U.S. Forest Service. Jim graduated with a B.S. in forestry resource, resources management and an M.S. in 
silviculture and forest uh, influences from the State University of New York, College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. And as a former Oregonian, I'm really especially excited to, uh, to welcome Jim and we are very eager to, to hear his remarks. So Jim, I see that your slides are, are going. So uh, over to you. Thanks, Don. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I know if you've seen the agenda um, earlier this month, you would have seen uh, a different person in this slide. It was Dr. Marlon Eve uh, from the USDA Agricultural Research Services, and, and he had to uh, cancel uh, at the last minute. And um, I'm sure he would have liked to have been here. And he would have given a, a very broader overview of all of USDA's climate efforts. Um, However, I'm, I'm focused on the Forest Service climate efforts, and uh, you need to keep in mind that USDA mainly deals with annual crops for food production, and, and I deal with trees. Um, and to me, trees are the answer, and they're my perennial favorite, so a little different here. Um, as of yesterday, USDA has a new leader. As Secretary Vilsack was confirmed by the US Senate, uh, he had previously served as the Secretary for eight years on, under the Obama administration, so you know, we'll be welcoming him back. Um, but with the change of, uh, with a new administration comes new priorities. And one of which is going to include climate actions. And the US Forest Service Research and Development is situated in a great position to respond to these actions with ongoing climate research and even operational projects that I will, I will share um, some of those with you today. U.S. Forest Service climate research solutions can be broken down into four lines of effort. Investing in natural climate solutions, wildfire decision support, managing for resilience, and innovation in science. Investments in natural climate solutions includes monitoring and analysis of carbon, climate smart land management practices, forest products, and environmental justice. I will focus on three efforts uh, which support the monitoring and analysis of carbon um, nationwide. Let's see if we could advance the slide. One of the key programs in R&D uh, produces the Re uh, Renewable Resources Planning Act Assessment. This program was legislatively mandated in 1974 during the era of environmental legislation in response to a growing public concern. Excuse me. tea with lemon, I hope that helps. While the Forest Service conducted natural resource analysis and trends since its existence under RPA, reports were required on a regular schedule. In the early 1900s, the assessment was mandated to consider climate change and forest carbon. <clears throat> RPA projections have been used as a basis of forest management and policy decisions and have contributed to US national climate assessment to make valid projections, a strong underlying data set of forest conditions is required. The data sets are largely taken from US Forest Service's Forest Inventory and Analysis Program, which monitors all lands and conducts field samples on all forested areas within the 50 states, US territories, and the Compact of Free Association states in the Pacific. The US <coughs> The U.S. Forest Service um, Inventory and Analysis Program, in association with key partners, have, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, <clears throat> in association with key partners, has recently produced two products which can help provide for improved monitoring of biomass and carbon accounting, and which will likely be used as the basis of further research on climate. The first is the Landscape Change Monitoring System, which utilizes the 36-year Landsat Archive to produce an annual forest change product. This product tracks disturbances and recovery for the contiguous U.S. annual, annually starting from 1985. The product is now live as of two weeks ago. The second product is the Big Data Mapping and Analytics Platform, or Big Map, <coughs> which has been developed under the Esri Enterprise Advantage program over the last few years and is nearing completion. The product also utilizes the Landsat Archive 
to model FIA field plots onto individual pixels, which allows the ability to generate thousands of spatial products, such as the ones demonstrated here, which graphically depict the rate relative ratios of forest carbon pool data and forest type groups. Such capability had not been possible without having access to cloud computing and the substantial image archive resources, such as those provided under the Esri Amazon Managed Cloud Services. It is hoped that EEAP will open the door for other applications within USDA to utilize GIS to conduct better spatial analyses in, the mitigating, in mitigating the impacts of climate change as well as support future actions. And here's a, a few links to connect to some of these products and I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jim. That was uh, that was great. So I'm I'm pausing a bit here because I'm uh, just going to put up again all of our panelists because we are extremely grateful to them for for the expertise and for what they have just shared, and we have an embarrassment of riches here because we wanted to have some time for an extensive roundtable discussion among them, as well as to engage questions and answers from the audience. Uh, with this being a special interest group meeting, rather than a paper session, we are going to uh, try to take as many of the questions and answers from the audience as we can. And so to that end, I want to shorten our roundtable discussion to just a couple of questions, because one of our one of the goals that uh, my colleagues, and I want to salute my colleagues, uh, Jeff Donzi and Kurt Hamill of our National Government Sciences team who played a V role in putting this session together. And we wanted to really reach out to uh, the 525 or so of you who are watching this session so that you could see yourself uh, in these initiatives. So I'd like to ask each of the panelists uh, how do, uh, and, and Julie's presentation especially was uh, focused on broad agency partnerships, but if each of the panelists in turn could talk about how they see uh, uh, other federal agency uh, staff, uh, other actors uh, being part of what their initiatives currently are. And and if I could also add a little twist to this in, uh, in terms of uh, the Biden-Harris climate initiatives as well. So uh, that's a very broad question, but I hope it's something that, that each of you can, can take in turn. And we'll just go in the same uh, uh, order uh, as we've had the presentation. So Larry, I'll start with you and then we'll go to Tom and then Julie and then Jim. And again, how do you see others uh, across the federal government, uh, including those in our audience, joining in on the initiatives that you have uh, presented? Sure. Yeah, well, first of all, um, since NASA is looking at collection, collecting data and trying to get it out and encouraging use of it, um, we don't actually have any responsibilities when it comes to helping state and locals or private sector and all. So everything that we do, is in partnership with other organizations and the federal agencies are the ones who, the other federal agencies, including the, the three today, you know, are the ones who have them to the decision makers, to the practitioners. Um, and so a key thing for us is to work in partnership with them so we can better understand what is actionable information. How can we better take the climate models that we have and if we are gonna run them and have outputs from them, or if there's gonna be information products from all of our observations, how do, we, um, how do we work with the partners so that the information products that we're creating and producing um, are gonna be actionable? Uh, and in some cases, you know, it may be information products that you know, are helping to, that, that might be GIS ready to fit into them. Um, so that, that's, a, that's very much an ongoing thing. I could say so much more about this, but I, I we want to hear from the others. So, mm -hmm. uh, um, and related relative to the um, the Biden um, Harris action uh, climate activities, when we read through the executive orders, um, 
while NASA may not necessarily be called out specifically in those executive orders, when we read it, we're like, in general, you're not going to be able to accomplish anything in those executive orders if we don't have the observations um, and, you know, and the modeling capabilities that are going to be critical to help identify some of the vulnerabilities, some of the potential impacts. Uh, and so that's a, that's a great opportunity that we see ourselves in, and it's going to help drive us to more partnership with the other agencies. Excellent points. Tom? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. I have a, an answer that's similar to Lawrence's because we, I mean, the national laboratories are here to advance scientific understanding to the benefit of, of the nation. And so our focus on better climate modeling is to advance the science of climate modeling, but also to provide that, be able to provide that data to, as, as, you know, as a national resource. All of the data and information that we produce is, is uh, keeping in mind who the end user of that is. And I'll be frank, like I'm not a climate scientist, I'm an engineer. And what is interesting and useful to a climate scientist may not be interesting and useful to an engineer. And so we want to ensure that the data that we're producing keeps that end user in mind so that we can align the data that we're producing with these use cases. And that's all predicated upon involvement and collaboration and close interaction with partners from different government agencies. So as you mentioned in, in the bio, we do a lot of work with Department of Homeland Security, with FEMA, we work with the Department of Defense. We do a lot of work also with, you know, as I mentioned, AT&T and other private sector companies and utilities, as well as uh, through some of these programs, state and local uh, agencies and organizations. And all of that interaction, you know, I, I don't have, I didn't have an image in my slide of all of us, you know, at an in-person meeting, um, you know, like Julie did, but, but we meet with a lot of people in person to understand what their needs are and try and align our modeling with that. So, um, you know, how do we feed other agencies work? It's, I mean, it's, it's through these partnerships that we're able to be successful in, in the modeling applications. And, and I'll give the last comment on, on the Biden-Harris uh, initiatives. You know, I think um, resilience is a growing part of that. Um, a lot of the discussion has been mitigation, decarbonization, and, you know, that's a whole other presentation from Argon and another Department of Energy National Labs on energy storage, grid efficiency, grid resilience, uh, a lot of activities far beyond what I discussed today that are, are focusing on on meeting a lot of the goals of, of the current administration. Great, thank you, Tom. Julie? So uh, thank you for the great question, actually. Um, I guess I, two, two answers. Um, you know, within NOAA, we do, we have a history of even the grants that we fund, most of them require uh, at least on the social science oriented side, a user engagement. So for things like NIHIS, uh, we we hope that they, we will be able to do more engagements and actually have longer term sustained engagements with not only the state and local health officials, but also other agencies. We are re-upping our interagency group. Um, we have new membership already. And so we're looking forward to sort of reinvigorating uh, that space on heat. I think also, um, you know, moving forward, we we are looking really to bridge that gap between, you know, the provision of information and the sectors which use it. And I, I want to, this begins to cross over to your question about the Biden administration, Biden-Harris administration. I think for, for heat, for instance, we've been working on environmental justice issues, just not calling it out as such. So we are thrilled to be able to sort of build a component into that. We're not funded enough to do everything that we would like to do, but I think there's enough interest in heat and health that we'll look, we'll look forward to really building out on multiple levels. And even globally, we, we are a part of a global heat health information network that is similarly structured, trying to share lessons on heat. So I, I guess um, moving forward, I see the ability to actually engage users uh, more in a sustained fashion and not just a public health official, but really getting to the public-private partnership, honestly, not just because we're here at the panel. I was thrilled to do the panel because I really think there's a, a novel way of doing, getting data that we just don't have access to otherwise, you know, especially on how do you understand health and demographics. And the only other piece I'm going to say about the opportunities that are before us now with the Biden-Harris administration is that 
the climate executive orders are are great, uh, but there is so much other reference in other orders to climate and climate and health, like National Security Directive 1 specifically calls for developing a center for climate forecast or for epidemic forecasting and analytics. And it says, understand climate change and health threats. There are other executive orders, and I think it's it's visionary that they've woven into some of these other orders, the links. It's incumbent of us now to sort of figure out how that all actually manifests. So I would say that those links are becoming clear, but still, you know, they're not, there's not a climate and health thing. There's not an oceans and health thing yet. I think it's, that's the challenge is to turn it all into really, really honest collaboration to serve the user needs um, moving forward. And that's um, what we're looking forward to, to have the opportunity to do that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more in, in this new era that we uh, are talking about the good work that all of your agencies have been doing needs to continue to come to the light. It's not as though we're starting from scratch here. And, and, and Jim, uh, the work that you talked about in your presentation is an excellent example of that. So I'll give, we'll give you the, the last word here. Thank you. Um, yeah, th so, I mean, we can't do it alone. And, that, and that's the reality is, and, and we do partner, do lots of partnerships. And um, keep in mind the Forest Service is really three different units. We got the research unit who I work for. We have our land management unit, the National Forest Systems, which actually manages 20% uh, of the US forested area. So it's a huge, huge amount of area. And of course we have our state and private, which coordinates the firefighting as well as forest health issues and, and uh, landowner assistance. And so they're very, very partnership dependent across multiple agencies as, and state uh, entities as well as private and, and uh, NGO. So we have lots of partnerships to try to help deliver us um, some of these actionable cli uh, climate items. Uh, to help us better manage our, our forest and, and elk recovery from the damages we've already seen. Um, large scale fires, insect and diseases, storm damages, all these things require a, a combined effort of, of multiple entities. And I'm gonna lose my voice again. <laughs> okay, okay. We, we don't want you to, to lose your voice, uh, Jim. Uh, your voice is extremely important uh, as are all of the voices on our panel. We have about eight minutes left uh, and we have a whole spate of questions, which is a testament to the, uh, the wonderful communication that all, all four of you did in presenting uh, your work. So we're not gonna be able to get to all of the questions, but I'm going to dive in here to a couple uh, that have been upvoted uh, by the audience. Uh, the first one is actually very relevant to uh, what we were just discussing with regard to the Biden-Harris uh, executive order. Uh, which calls out specific appointments for agency staffing positions. So the question is, have uh, your agencies been able to appoint individuals uh, under the new executive order? And uh, any of you can, can chime in or it sounds as though the answer is, is a collective uh, no to that. This is Lawrence. I can say that while, again, while NASA may not be called out as much in the executive order, that we have announced our first ever senior climate advisor. And so Kevin Schmidt um, is the new climate science advisor at NASA. Uh, and it's really there to try and make sure that NASA science is at the applications, the analysis uh, of that. Uh, and so um, we're, we're sort of leaning in with a new position to, we can bring our observations to bear on these climate issues that a lot of these other agencies are going to be working. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, the next question, uh, it, it's a NASA question, but um, maybe all of you uh, can chime in. Uh, the question is, how is NASA climate data being used to predict impacts from increasingly more severe natural disasters? And I think this is a good question because it, it lends itself even to uh, Julie with all of the, the health work that you, are, that you are doing. So again, how is NASA climate data being used to predict impacts from increasingly more severe natural disasters?
I, I just answered, but I, I'm, I was wondering if the others might be able to sort of talk about how they're using NASA data. If not, I can certainly mm -hmm. provide. Did, did, you want, did you want Julie or someone to go first, Don? Uh, yes, uh, just to uh, chime in, uh, and, and it is a good point, Lawrence, in terms of uh, how others are, are using NASA data, because I think that might be the intent of the, of the questioner. Yeah, so I can, I will speak to that um, a little bit. You know, we have a whole data center, so we house all kinds of data. Um, and the projects that we fund from our grants, we don't, we don't have specific requirements on it. But I will say um, that when it comes to putting out a forecast or doing some things that we hope become operational, it's pretty important that we work closely with between NASA and NOAA, making sure that the data sets that are the backbone of what we're relying on um, are sustainable. And that's part of what the group on Earth Observation helps us do is, is at least on the health side, identify those most useful data sets, some of which are NASA. I know that NASA has been heavily involved in um, the Centers for Disease Control Environmental Health Tracking Program I have as well. And that's based on some of the core NASA data sets, some of the core NOAA data sets. So I think the, the answer is, um, twofold. We use what we can working with the health end users, speaking for health only, um, and we also use that engagement to help identify how to either better produce or reanalyze or uh, the data sets we have or what else we need to collect in the future um, in terms of sensors or data collection or observing networks. So um, yes, it's not just the NASA data, but you guys are a core backbone of a lot of the, the important health work and some of the the long-term like uh, Climate Reference Network and HCN are also there in a, in a stable way for the health community. Mm -hmm. but, but it's really figuring out how to, how to make either, how to make the gross, like the forecast products that come out on a three month basis are pretty broad scale. And it's not that useful for a health person in New York City to get a three month forecast at a broad scale. So how do we, how do we integrate the data sets so that they can actually make meaningful information for a decision maker on the health side? To me, that's where the rubber hits the road, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're there in the background, but Lawrence, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or Tom, I, I'm still, I'm still wanting Tom's, you know, runoff models to come into looking at coastal health infrastructure. So you, you're, you, so you're you can have them. <laughs> We're going to have to do that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there is a question for Tom, a very specific question from the audience about the hydrography and elevation data sets that you're using to feed your flood models. I saw that one in the uh, in the moderation tool here, and in short, I'm not 100% sure. The, uh, the I showed those two columns in my slides. I'm more on the application side than the the mo climate modeling so slide. So I'm happy to uh, defer that one virtually to my colleagues in our, our environmental sciences division who run the the hydrology models. Um, I will say the tools that we use, um, the, the climate model, regional climate model is called the uh, Weather Research Forecasting Model. This is from the National Center of Atmospheric Research, NCAR. Uh, and the, the hydrologic model that I showed in the clip is, is Wharf Hydro, which is a package that uh, is associated with, with the Weather Research and Forecasting Model. So that would be, uh, I think, the first thing to investigate online. And then if you have more specific questions to the Whoever asked that, I'd be happy to you know shoot me an email and we can we can chat that way. All right, thanks, Tom. I'm going to take one more question, and this is for for Jim. How does the U.S. Forest Service view tribes as partners in climate resilience planning, especially when tribal land management has been shown to increase ecosystem resiliency in the face of climate change? We we definitely um, our local units, um, as well as our national units, um, are, are thoroughly engaged with our partners, um, with our tribal uh, partners, um, especially in the local areas. Um, they, they bring a certain level of expertise um, um, to, the, uh, um, <clears throat> to, the, to the general uh, operations, but they also, um, um, we work in, in conjunction with being able to um, engage with them to try to uh, uh, mitigate uh, um, actions that require <laughs> um, changes to the uh, to the. Um, um, I'm, I'm not speaking well here. <laughs> um, they are very thoroughly engaged in in all our management plans. Um, they um, 
offer us support, especially in fire mitigation, um, to try to help us uh, um, combat uh, the ongoing threat from uh, from fires, as well as uh, some of the um, challenges that are associated with with trying to restore um, some of these ecosystems, um, especially in watersheds, as well as the um, revegetation. Um, we, we used to have um, a pretty big reforestation program and they were actually uh, growing seedlings for us in, in some cases. But, um, but now uh, we're probably gonna have to be looking at <coughs> other sources to try to help um, get us to the point of, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm about to lose my voice again. Oh, that's uh, okay, Jim. Let's uh, let's save let's save your voice as I think we're about to to get uh, to the end of our session here. And so so thank you for that, and thank you so much to all of our panelists, to the audience. Clearly, we have much more to discuss, and we do it as we have another event, which might be a venue for which we can continue our discussion, which is the Esri Ocean Weather and Climate Forum in November. And so please stay tuned for that. Go to www.esri.com slash events slash ocean. That's one way to quickly get to that site. And we look forward to indeed continuing the conversation among all of the panelists, all of the agencies with us at Esri, with you uh, in the audience. And we thank you so much for attending.